This morning we are continuing in Psalm 25 in this passage of scripture that I said to you a couple of weeks ago when we began. Um, This passage of scripture teaches us to pray. And I I can't tell you how many times as a pastor people have asked me, you know, uh, how exactly do I pray? Is Is it okay to pray for this or is it wrong to pray like this? And Psalm 25, if we work through it carefully, answers quite a few of those questions. I encourage you, the second thing I want to say, especially if you're new with Beacon Communities, um, we don't believe that a pastor has anything worthwhile to say. Amen? (laughs) That's absolutely true. We really don't believe a pastor has anything worthwhile to say, and the pastor's family knows that better than anybody else. Um, And so what I'd encourage you to do is get a Bible, and if you don't own a Bible, just uh, you can find some on the back table there. And if you put up your hand right now, if you're sitting, I know that Deanne will be happy to bring you a Bible, and we'll get you the page number. Uh, and uh, we want you to be able to follow along in the scripture with what I'm going to teach about this morning, because it doesn't matter what I say, but would you agree that it does matter very much what God says? Right, so ignore what I say if it disagrees with what God is saying in his scripture. If, if you see what God is saying in his scripture, you're more likely to be changed by that experience. Uh, and so that's, that's what we do. We preach God's word here at Beacon Communities Church. So Psalm 25, and this morning we're focusing on one verse, so this is going to be a five-minute sermon. <clears throat> and if you believe that, you obviously don't know me. <laughs> So again, Father, we ask that your spirit would lift up our eyes to understand this passage of scripture in Jesus' name. So uh, Psalm 25, let's read it again. It's very simple, it's very brief. Verse 11, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. When you look at that verse, how would you characterize the mood of this verse? How would you describe the, the sort of the the emotion of this verse. Any thoughts? Pardon me? Sorrowful and penitent. That's good. Somber. Not cheerful, hey? Humble. Humble. It's good. The word I came up with was distress, but I like what Brian said. Sorrowful and penitent, humble, uh, what Andrew said. Heather said somber. These things capture that. But think, think of distress. There's a reason why I say that. See, the writer King David here, he is desperate. And he's grasping. He's grasping for relief from what is causing him emotional anguish. So when you read Psalm 25, verse 11, you shouldn't read it like this. This is how not to read the Bible. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. (laughs) You really ought to have some tears in your eyes, and you ought to be on your knees when you read this like David did. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. You get get the sense. David is in distress here. And I'm curious about it. See, back in verse 1, we saw that when David felt very low down, there was a reason in his circumstances for him to cry out to God like he does in verse 1, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You don't lift up your soul. You don't try to reach up to God when you're already high up. You, You do that from a low place. So David felt so low down, so in such difficult circumstances that he reaches up and grasps for God's help. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And you see in verse 11, he's doing it again. In verse 11, he's back on his knees and something has caused him in distress to look for relief from his anguish and help and cry out to God. For your sake, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great He wants happiness, but he's got misery. He wants relief because he's got a burden. And he knows that the only chance for happiness lies with God. Right? So here's the question I'm asking. Why now? Why in the middle of Psalm 25 does David write this verse of distress? Why now? Is it a good time to pray? That's my first heading. 
Uh, this should be on your screen. Is it a good time to pray? See, this is the third sermon that we've had now on the Psalm 25 series. And you'll remember that this psalm is a alphabetical acrostic. So every verse begins with the next or a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which means there's an order, right? That, obviously, that means there's an order to the psalm, A, B, C. It's actually not, it skips a couple letters and repeats a couple a letter twice and so on, but still in order. So it's like A, B, C, D, D, E, F, H, and so on. So there's order to it, but verse 11 is right in the middle here. And I also said a couple weeks ago that this psalm goes like this. It's prayer, meditation, prayer, meditation, prayer. So there's a pattern, there's a cycle, a repeating pattern of prayer and meditation. This verse is a prayer. Verse 11 is a prayer. Right in between two segments of meditation. So if you follow me, in verses 1 to 7, David had been praying. In verses 8, 9, and 10, David had been thinking about what he'd learned about God and meditating about who God is. And all of a sudden, he's back on his knees in anguish. This is a little bit like walking out of Sunday school or walking out of church, feeling pretty good about God, feeling happy that you worship God and that you believe in God and all that, and all, getting out the front door and falling on your knees then. Why now? You see what I'm asking? What happened to make David pray like this in verse 11? If you look at verses 1 to 7, he doesn't exactly ask for forgiveness. That's the other prayer part that we've already looked at. Verses 8, 9, and 10 is a meditation. Verses 1 to 7 is a prayer. In verses 1 to 7, he didn't actually ask for forgiveness. He said, Lord, don't remember me on account of me, on account of my sins of my youth or my transgressions. Remember me for your sake, Lord. Remember your mercy, God. Remember your loving kindness, God. But he didn't exactly say, forgive me my sin, did he? David's prayer does kind of seem a little out of place. But in his, his wonderful, if you've heard of Charles Spurgeon, he was a 19th century preacher. He's called the Prince of Preachers, famous London, England Baptist preacher, uh, here, here for the Baptists. And Charles Spurgeon wrote a wonderful commentary on the Psalms that is available on Amazon as a Kindle book. And you can get it on the Kobo as well, or you can buy the hard copy, but it's like 22 volumes. But I do encourage you to pick it up because it is absolutely wonderful to read the Psalms and read a little bit of Spurgeon. Virgin's explanation and go back and forth, it'll bless your heart. It'll really enrich your, your prayer life. But in this uh, commentary series, The Treasury of David, Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, this sentence of prayer, verse 11, this sentence of prayer would seem out of place if it weren't for the fact that prayer is always in its place, in season or out of season. See, I couldn't agree more. David in verse 10 Back one verse, he was thinking about those people who really hang on to God's covenant, who keep God's testimonies, who put their trust in God. And he was remembering, oh yeah, there have been times in my life where I've hung on to God's testimonies, and I've kept his covenant, I've tried to obey him, and I've put my trust in him. And then David remembers his sin. The thing going on in verse 11 is that David is moving from praying because of his circumstances, what's going on around him in life, how hard his life is, and if you remember it, it was pretty bad. Now David is concerned about the sin in his heart, and he's desperate. It makes him desperate to look for some relief to the only place he can get it, so he reaches out again to God. This is a reason... There is never a bad time to pray. My friends, we're just like David. Things might be going well. Life might be going easy. We might have prosperity. The kids might be just fine. I said might. And then we're walking along a roof one moonlit evening, and we look down, and what do we see? Bathsheba taking a bath. And all of a sudden, life goes off the rails. We might be going along. We might be walking out of church on the way out. And things would be pretty good. We're feeling pretty good about life. We're feeling like, you know what? I think I'm pretty good with God. And then 
when there's no temptation in sight, there's no like bad circumstance that we see is about to trip us up, and all of a sudden, wham! Suddenly we fall into sin. Or am I the only one who's experienced this? I'm good to see you uh, smiling, sort of, and some of you going, oh. At the most unlikely times when it feels like we're strong and we have reasons to think our spiritual life is pretty healthy, it's at those times that we fail. And the shame sweeps over us at the weirdest times. Am I right? We didn't plan for this to happen. But we fall on our knees and we beg God's mercy. And we say, God, I need to know once again now that you love me. I need to know that you can forgive me. So there's never a bad time to pray. Now I want you to notice two things here about verse 11, both of which are actually pretty obvious, but which explain why David suddenly prays and why this prayer is so bold. Because it is a bold prayer, isn't it? I want you to notice two things. First, well, let's look at it first. Verse 11, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt. Pardon, it means to ask for forgiveness, a complete, um, what's that thing people ask the governor for? There's another word. Clemency. Yeah, there's a pardon is, okay, so it's like when a, <laughs> it's like when a person asks for a pardon. It is when a person asks for a pardon. That's what it is. Okay, forgive me. Uh, so two things. First is to notice that David believes he is very guilty. That's the first thing to notice here. David believes, look at the words. Why would I say that David believes he is very guilty? Why would I say that? Anyone who's reading the text? If you're not reading the text, you're not going to be answer, able to answer any of my questions. Uh, but why would David believe his sin is very, very... Why would he believe he's very guilty here? He says. How much guilt does he say he has? Lots. He says his guilt is great, right? Th- those are the words. My guilt is great. So the second thing, that's the first thing. David believes he is very guilty. The second thing to notice is that David has a very strange confidence that God will forgive him. Did you see it? He believes God's going to forgive him. He does not bargain or negotiate or try to say, but God, I'm really a pretty good person. God, yes, I've sinned. I know I sinned. I really I made a mistake. But look at all the other good things in my life. He doesn't say that, does he? He doesn't negotiate. He doesn't bargain. Did you see that? This is a lousy bargaining tactic. We're going to come back to that. There's never a bad time to pray. He says his guilt is great, yet he boldly asks God to pardon him. He just asks, God, pardon me. Pardon my sin. Pardon my guilt. And knowing just how serious or guilt or how serious our guilt is, knowing that should make us urgent to pray. It should give us a sense of urgency. The more trouble we're th- we think we're in, the more we'll reach out for help, right? And if we have reasons to believe God will forgive us, not maybe, but will. If we had reasons to believe God will 100% of the time forgive us, wouldn't we pray more often? Wouldn't we reach out to him more often for that sense of assurance and comfort and encouragement and hope? And David doesn't pray a long prayer. He prays a very short prayer. It's one verse, not even a big verse. If we had the faith, the confidence that David does, maybe we would pray at really odd times too. Maybe we would pray suddenly in the middle of doing our laundry. Now you know that's a hypothetical for me. I don't do a lot of laundry or wash the dishes. I'm, I'm not a good person. But maybe we would pray in the middle of walking the dog. Maybe we would pray in the middle of getting the groceries. Maybe we would pray in the middle of whatever work we're doing. 
Because those are the times when we feel our sin that we need God to help us. And if we knew that God would give us forgiveness, can you just imagine it? So this morning, what I want to explore in verse 11 is how David could be so sure that God would pardon his great guilt. Because you and I are more likely to pray when we feel a strong need if we can be confident that the God of David will answer our prayers. So here's my next question. How do we know God will answer our prayers? Should be up on the screen. How do we know God will answer our prayers? See, in the Bible, the Bible God has made it very clear in the scriptures that he does not listen to some prayers. And I want you to be a little bit like bothered by that. It's a troubling thought. But the Bible is quite clear that there are some kinds of prayers God will ignore and there are some kinds of people whose prayers God will not hear. I'm going to be careful to explain this and if, you, if I've left, left you with any uh, uncertainty around this afterwards, if I've not answered your questions completely, please talk to me after the service or send me an email. I want to reassure you what the scripture does in fact say. But here it is. Psalm 66, 18 says that... Um, Where am I here? If someone cherishes sin in his heart, the Lord will not listen to his prayer. What does cherish mean? I cherish my wife. What do I mean by that? I I not only love her, I hold her close, I treasure her, I find great significance in her, she means a lot to me. If we treat sin like that in our hearts and we hold it close and we hug it and we kiss it, you get what I'm saying. If we love our sin, I'll stop the analogy right there. If we treat our son like we, would, we should treat our spouse, our, our sin, I mean, if we treat our sin like... <laughs> wow. <laughs> I apologize, Daniel. Uh, if we treat our sin like we should treat our spouse, then God does not listen to our prayer. It's very clear. Psalm 66, 18 says that. Psalm 109, verse 7 implies that some presumptuous prayers might actually be counted as sin presumptuous prayers that pray on a basis on a right that we have no right to and then there's in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 15 after God says to his people that he is so tired of their religious ceremonies when they don't mean it when they're faking it all the time the people who never actually repent from their sin he says this to them he adds in Isaiah 1 15 When you spread out your hands, like imagine somebody bowing down and spreading out their hands in prayer. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. This is troublesome, isn't it? This is disturbing. Another time in the New Testament, there's a brand new believer named Simon. This is in Acts chapter 8. Who Simon tried to offer Jesus' apostles money because he thought God's gifts could be bought. He thought he could kind of get some power from God if he paid enough. And he was so wrong, and Peter the apostle warned him to repent and pray for forgiveness. So let me illustrate what I'm trying to talk about. There is a difference between the kind of prayer God will never answer and the kind of prayer God will always answer. There's a difference. Let me illustrate it this way. My cousin, she's actually a second cousin, she's dating a really nice guy. And they went camping, I think with some friends. And and when they were camping, she got really, really sick and had to stay in bed all day. So what did this really nice guy do for her? Since she had to be in bed all day, you know, the sun moves and tents are hot. So he moved her tent into the shade so she could rest comfortably nice guy he didn't do this one time he did this seven times he moved her tent seven I hate camping because I hate setting up tents (laughs) he did this seven times for her moved her tent relocated it into the shade throughout the day really nice guy and then he sat there and he read to her all day long oh what a nice guy now I would like to wager that if you went to this guy and said, okay, we're going camping, I want you to come with me, and I'd like you to move my tent when I'm sick. (laughs) And then I'd like you to sit with me and read to me all day long. 
You know, if Brian asked this guy, if Brian asked him, I guarantee you he's going to say no. Find, find your own tent mover. What's the difference between a stranger asking for that kind of help and his girlfriend? One word. Love. It's love. The difference between you and my cousin is that he loves my cousin, this guy. And she loves him. And that's what's missing when God refuses to listen to some prayers. Love. So the thing we need to be asking is, how can I know that God loves me? How can I know that God loves me? If we can be assured of his love for us, we would be able to pray with real confidence, right? Romans 5.8 tells us how we can know 100% that God loves us. I want you to look at Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8 says this. Or if, you're, if, if I'm moving too fast, just write it down. The, the re- reference, Romans 5, verse 8. But God shows his love. Oh, here it is. God shows his love. Now we're going to find out how God shows his love and how I can know God loves me. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if you say, I know God loves me because I'm a good person. You're deceived. You're wrong. Romans 5.8 said, this is how God shows his love. God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were what? Still sinners. Christ died for us. So forget the I'm a good person thing. That's not in Romans 5.8. That's not what, who God says he loves is good people. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God shows his love by sending Jesus to die for, of all people, sinners. God showed his love for us means that the only people who can know for sure that God's love them, that God loves them, are the sinners Jesus died to save. Do you see how that makes sense there? According to that verse? Do you see it? I'm not asking for it to all make sense. I'm just asking that that's what that verse said, right? So the only people that can know for sure God loves them are the sinners Jesus died to save. And Jesus himself tells us in John 3.16 how we can know whom Jesus died to save. How do we know who Jesus, whom is the proper, whom Jesus died to save? John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him, specifically whoever believes that God gave Jesus to save sinners like you and me, whoever believes that, that's who receives everlasting life, so that's who God saves through the death of Jesus. You're following me, right? So again, David would not be praying, verse 11, if he thought he could save himself or be a good enough person. He knows he's a sinner. He's not arguing that point. He even knows his sin is huge. He says, my guilt is great. So where does he turn to? Where does he go for help when he knows he's got this huge guilt he can't do anything about? Where does he go? He goes to God. He throws himself on God's mercy. And in case you're wondering how David could possibly be saved by Jesus 1,000 years before Jesus Christ was born, I want to just say to you, the Psalms, there's at least 16 Psalms that have specific Predictions, specific prophecies about the coming of Jesus. 16 Psalms David wrote that point to Jesus, that wait for Jesus, that are expecting Jesus to come. 16 Psalms. In Psalm 65, verse 3, by itself, David is looking forward to blessing and salvation and atonement and grace and happiness through the coming Messiah. He's waiting for Jesus, he just doesn't know his name. 
He's believing in Jesus. He just doesn't know what he's going to do. But he knows he's going to atone for sins. He knows he's going to rescue sinners. So good news. This is good news. That God is going to send someone to rescue sinners. Wouldn't you say that's good news? Not good people, not deserving people, not people who've got a mulsey all together and just need a little bit of a helping hand. That's not you and me. Our guilt is great. We need rescue, not help. So you can be confident in your prayer that God will hear your prayer on one condition that you're praying with gospel faith. You're praying on account of the good news. You're praying waiting for Jesus or hoping in Jesus, trusting in Jesus. You can be confident God will hear your prayer only if the faith behind your prayers is gospel faith. Good news faith. And here now I want to show why only gospel faith can save you. Romans 1.16 is Paul's bold declaration at the beginning of the book of Romans that he was not ashamed of publicly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because he says this, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. When God saves people, Paul is saying God saves people with power. And what is that power with which God saves people, says Paul? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of this gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So let me wrap up Psalm 25, 11 with two reasons why only gospel faith can save you and me. The first reason is this. That only the gospel gives hope to sinners. Religion gives hope to pretty good people. Only the gospel gives hope to sinners. Look again at verse 11. Verse 11 goes like this. You should have it memorized by now. For, my, for your name's sake, O Lord, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Look in this verse and notice that David had no reason for hope if God only deals with people according to what they deserve. You see that? There was no reason for hope if David had to deserve it. He said his guilt is great. This is so backwards from human ordinary thinking. Try, try going into your bank and saying, I need a really big loan because my debts are so huge I'll never be able to pay you back. <laughs> How's that going to work for you? You know, I've almost tried it. <laughs> it doesn't work. See, this is backwards economics, what David is saying. God, pardon my guilt because it's huge. He didn't actually say that. He gave a different reason, but he said, pardon my guilt. It is huge, but he gives another reason. Humans could never have invented the gospel of Jesus Christ. No one goes to the bank like this, and David doesn't go to God like this either. David is not asking for what he deserves. He is asking for what he knows he could never deserve. The pardon, the forgiveness of a huge guilt. He is depending on God's grace. That's it. That's what faith is. Depending on God's grace, on the gift of God. Not what we deserve. And that's why only if we confess we are sinners will God hear our prayers and save us. Because only sinners who are praying for mercy are depending on God's grace. Right? David has nowhere else to turn, no other hope besides grace. So his faith, that is his depending, is on the good news that God gives grace. That's the gospel. It's the good news that God gives grace to, to sinners. The second reason that only gospel faith can save is that only the gospel gives sinners love for God. Religion doesn't make us love God. The gospel gives us reasons to love God and begins to retrain our hearts to love God. 
Gospel faith depends on God's grace, and because of that, believers in the gospel rely on God's loving nature. Do you see? It's like when my cousin spent that day sick in her tent and watched this young man go to extraordinary effort to make her comfortable and keep her company. When we who are sinners begin to see the truth of what God has done to rescue us, then just like Teresa said about that guy, we go, ah, <laughs> except more heartfelt and less feminine. <laughs> we go, wow, that's more manly, right? When we begin to see what God has done, what the gospel reveals to us, how can we not fall in love with God? If you don't love God, it's because you don't clearly hold the gospel in front of you and let that be your picture of God. The more you hold the gospel in front of you and admire his picture in the gospel, the more your heart responds and you go, wow, God is wonderful. And your heart begins to respond. You can't help it. I can't help it. When we who are sinners begin to see the truth of who God is and what he's done, his extraordinary rescue, that God became a man and died to rescue us, sinners. We fall in love. The gospel moves our sinner hearts to begin to love God. And so the difference between the prayer God will not hear and the prayer that God loves to answer is like the difference between love and lust. Look again at verse 11. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. See, lust is only interested in what it can take for itself, what it can get for itself, right? But love, on the other hand, wants the very best for the loved one, wants the best for the beloved. Which one of these, lust or love, do you see in David's heart in verse 11? Which one do you see in verse 11? In his prayer to God. I see love. Because David's reason for asking boldly for what he does not deserve is not on account of himself. It's not to get what he wants. Yes, he wants pardon. But he gives a bigger reason. He says, for your name's sake, O Lord. That's where it's love. Why do you think that God will answer David's prayer for grace? David says, it's for your name's sake, O Lord. When David says, for your name's sake, he's talking about God's reputation. He wants the very best for God. And the very best for God is that people will love God for who he is and love him as much as he deserves. That the whole earth will bend the knee and praise God and love him with all their hearts because he deserves it. David wants to see the love of God spread everywhere from coast to coast, continent to continent. David wants to see everyone falling in love with the one who is most worthy of all of our love in the whole universe. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. David then wants God's gospel to spread everywhere so that people are moved to love the God who gives them forgiveness they don't deserve, who gives grace all the time through Jesus Christ. He's not content here to have the gospel whispered in a corner. He wants it shouted from a mountaintop. David is not content here to see people stingy and getting a little bit of love for God as he gives a little bit. He wants people to be sold out and won over by the unbelievable, pursuing, winsome, wooing love of God. David is praying that by God forgiving his great guilt, that the gospel of the coming Messiah, who we know as Jesus Christ, the salvation he was waiting for, that this good news would spread far and wide, and that multitudes of sinners would hear that gospel and pray to God. Because David says in Psalm 65, 5, By your awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God, of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth. He's waiting for the ends of the earth to begin to love God. 
pray to God, not with religious lust, what they can get from God, but with heartfelt love for what he has done for them. Prayers of love. Prayers that fall upon the grace of such a merciful Savior as Jesus. For the sake of your own name, Lord. So let's let's stop trivializing and justifying our sin. Can we do that? Let's stop trivializing and justifying our guilt. David doesn't. He says it's great. He admits it. Let's ask God to lead us by his Holy Spirit to love Jesus more than anything and pray with that love. As Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, Christ Jesus is the radiance. Think of the radiance of the sun. If the sun is God and Jesus is the shining of the sun, that's what Hebrews is saying. Christ Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. See, when David says, for your name's sake, O Lord, the name he is talking about is the name of Jesus. For your name's sake, he is the Lord's name, Jesus. So what's better than asking God for forgiveness? What should we want more than forgiveness? Even more than him to pardon our great guilt? We, would, we should want the glory of God to be known in Jesus. That God would show himself to the nations. Let all peoples praise you to the ends of the earth. I pray that every one of us will come to see Jesus as infinitely worthy. As being the treasure in our hearts that we cherish. No longer the sin that we hold so close. Do you agree? So this week, when you realize with me, when I too and you, when we realize our guilt over and over again, I pray that every one of us will ask God to pardon us, not for what we get out of it, but so that the glory of his marvelous grace would be made known more widely, more clearly, by forgiving and redeeming and changing people like us. We need a lot of help. Would you agree with that? But we have a marvelous God who is in the business of changing lives through the grace of Jesus Christ. Would you agree with that? So let's ask God to forgive our sin, not for our sake, but for the sake of his glory ask him to pardon us in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I am so blessed by your grace and generosity that you treat us not with what we deserve, but with what we could never have deserved. That you treat us according to the merit and the worthiness of your own son who lived the perfect life that we could simply not live. He earned it all. And he died the death that every one of us deserved to die for our sins. But he took our place. And Lord, you've announced that this was your way of saving us. And when we hear that good news and we depend on it, we believe it. Lord, you say we are saved. You've demonstrated your love for us by showing us this, that Jesus died for sinners. And believing that promise, we know we are those sinners he died to save. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making this word known to us. Thank you, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. All glory to you. Amen.